Hi, this is Kevin Martin here with Jennifer Phillips Russo. We are here doing our weekly uh, update from Lake Erie Regional Grape Program. And uh, just wanted to touch base with you about bud cold hardiness, uh, what Jen's been doing in that area over the last few months. Uh, as we uh, start to approach springtime, things are starting to slowly change and I'll turn it over to Jen for an update. Yeah, thanks Kevin. Hi everybody. So over the past season, we have been working on some research that's been funded by the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And basically it was a grant to test cold hardiness under different, different cropping level conditions. It got a little more well-rounded and I'm going to explain it briefly for you without making your mind turn in circles. Basically we're testing natives, hybrids and vinifera. So we chose Concord as a native, we chose Vignol as the hybrid and Riesling as a vinifera. All of these vines are located at the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Laboratory in Portland, New York. And I worked there with their staff to do what we called timely cluster drops. So we had a high, a medium and a low cropping levels. And we also had a control where we just left everything. I'm not gonna go into all the differences of what those were for you. I just wanna let you know what the results are thus far. So we also did it at timing. So we dropped clusters just after, um, <clears throat> excuse me, fruit set. I can't even think today. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> we just did it just after fruit set. Then we also dropped clusters at right after Verasion started and 30 days post bloom. See how that happened? Fruit set, 30 days post bloom, then Verizon when we did all of our cluster drops. It has been a week, people, and I know I don't have to explain to you because we're all in the same boat here. So after doing all of that, we then monitored the cold hardiness. We started collecting canes from bud positions three to seven during all of the different treatments that we had, and there were nine for each one, except for Concord had a high and low. I'm sure you've all heard and are aware of the Concord Cornell Big Red Sea, a variable rate trial within a variable rate trial that Terry Bates was running. So we used the high crop level in there and the low crop level. So in, in that one, did you do the same kind of cluster drops or you just we did relied on the seed? not. We just okay. used, and that wasn't a part of the grant. It was just different sure. cropping levels. So some of them are a little more involved than others. So we just and used were some any from- of these, Were any of these cropping levels really high or- I mean, can you provide some context to that? So I can tell you about the Revaz Index only in the Concords right now, because we're sure. giving, we haven't done any pruning weights yet because we're still waiting to prune them a little bit for the vinifera and the hybrid, give them a little extra time there. But in the Concord, the Concord, the high ended up being a range between 3.4 and 9.2 on the Revaz Index, which gave us an average of like 5.3, really not that high. Right. But that was the highest crop level at that time. Mm -hmm. And then in the low, we added a range between 2.3 and 5.2 with an average of a 2.7. But we did still see differences in there, just so you know. Not huge, but I will walk you through that in just a second here. Yeah, and this is not a podcast about the Revaz Index, which we could do at some point. So if, if you're not familiar with that index, I would just add that both of those cropping levels on a commercial scale would be considered low and pretty low. Maybe, you know, if you look back historically, a bad average year, you know, four or five ton to the acre for most commercial green vineyards. Now we're taking into account pruning weights here. So the, the actual yield certainly could have been higher than four ton to the acre, but these are not considered commercially high uh, Revaz indexes at right. this time. So right. that's why we get multiple years to do this research. We'll get a high that's that's actually high that might scare a few people at some point. <laughs> so let me just kind of first a brief overview of what I reported on this. For the Concord ones, both, both of those different samples, what we're considering a higher and a lower cropping level, like Kevin just said, it's not based on the Revaz index there, just what we had in that particular trial at that time. One was higher than the other. And both of those, set, those samples held similar trends. I'll show you some numbers here in a minute. There were altering highs and lows, like they flip-flopped throughout the season, but all in all, they had an average of only 1.18 degrees difference. So one was higher one week, one was lower, 
higher the next week, but it was only a, like a degree difference between the two. That could mean something if it came down like we had in May when everybody was a little bit worried about where we were hovering in degrees, but right now everything's dormant. And I'll show you where we are on that critical temperature. We're nowhere near it. So I have no reason to worry about any of that right now. In the Riesling trial, so the vinifera portion of that, the, revol the results indicated that a medium crop level or five shoots per linear foot with one cluster per shoot had consistently outperformed the other cropping levels, which were high was five shoots per linear foot with two clusters and low was four shoots per linear foot with one cluster. And that medium one there has consistently with the bud hardiness outperformed than the other two. And then we had our hybrid, which is the Vignoles. And right now the results are showing that we just don't have a clear outperformer in this one. There's a couple of things that could be attribute, contributing to that. And there's just, I won't go into that right now, but right now they're all still hardy, but there's not one or the other that's just, hey, you should crop this way. But at least we were testing it to see. And now I'm gonna show you some numbers there. Kevin, do you have any questions up to this part? No, I don't think so. Okay. So if you can go on lergp.com and you can watch these numbers because they're all posted out there for you if you're interested to see what the results were. Right now, I'm going to just show you what the latest ones are. And I think that they're posted on the website right now. I'm gonna share my screen, one second. You can see that, Kevin? Yes. Do you want me to make it larger or do you think it's good enough? Um, you could probably zoom in a little. Okay. Well, these are the weeks. Let's just focus over here. This is the latest date. As you can see, we're only half a degree difference between those two different cropping levels, keeping in mind that nothing was severely overcropped in there. And then I also did another one where we had Riesling. This was for one of my, our growers wanted to know if they could just spur prune their vinifera, or if they had to tie canes, or they were just interested to see if there would be a difference there. And we are showing actually, if you left two 15 bud canes, it was more hardy than if you did a five bud spurs, or we did six five bud spurs, or we did 15 two bud spurs in this particular one. The Riesling, you'll see there are two here. That's because of the different rootstocks. We had some un own rooted, and then we had, I don't, please don't keep, <laughs> hold me to this. I'm pretty sure it's on 3309, but I just, it's a better rootstock and it's an outside row. So we're not even posting this information, but you have a quick eye, look at it here. <laughs> is that, um, is the Riesling own rooted? Is that from the own rooted trial that happened? Every time this was from the trial of Greg Loeb when he was doing phylloxera. Yeah. Okay. And yes, yeah, so, and then there's missing vines in there because they had to destructively harvest some of those vines. And so it was all these Riesling vines, which by the way, was about 365. So it's not a small trial by any means. Mm -hmm. And what we did in here, you can see that this, these are where we are for the LT50s, where 50% of the buds actually perished at this particular temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So all that information is out there. If you have any questions, you can definitely reach out. I want to pull this up. This is also on the LERGP website. The current phenology, we are still dormant. We collected another sample today and they're being froze. We'll have that information ready for you by Thursday or Friday, but everything is still dormant right now. There's no bud swell. There's no movement there. And the critical temperatures, if you were interested, and I posted this in the past in certain crop updates. Let me get over to it. Hey, it's this one. So we're here. And it says that we can have, if you're like swelling here, like this is more water. This is where we really worry about if we have a frost and that's going to then damage those buds. We don't have to worry yet. They're still tucked in there and the bud hardiness is, like we said, oh, jeepers creepers. Concords right now, we could get down to negative three degrees Fahrenheit and it's not really projected right now in the, in the forecast. So I think we can all rest a little easy right now on that. Let me share my screen real quick and I would just add a little bit to what you're saying there. 
Um, just being who I am, and if you'd rather be worrying rather than resting easy. Um, so Penn State and Cornell teamed up as, as part of the, their statewide teams to do uh, webinars over the course of the winter. You can register for the next one at extension.psu.edu. Uh, here's the information there. This is free. Um, Ahmed Dami of Ohio State and um, will be one of the guest instructor, instructors for that. And the last time I heard him speak now would be about the time to apply chemicals to delay um, frost or to create frost mitigation by delaying the coming out of dormancy. Um, the, he's continued to do research in that area. So I don't know if you're already late and you need to hop on the sprayer today, or if there are some new chemicals out there um, to, um, to help the delay of deacclimation and the delay of bud swell. Mm -hmm. specifically. And so, rumor has it that um, he's gonna be doing some research with Dr. Terry Bates right. this coming season. Yep. So I'm, I'm gonna be learning along with you guys if you guys wanna attend that. I do know that you know, the traditional research was rooted in stylet oil. It's a nice product for Concords because it's cheap. Uh, the sooner you do that, the more of an effect you get. You just have to be really careful. And a lot of, uh, a lot of people don't even recommend it because if you overdo it on the rates, you can create some damage. And obviously creating damage when you're trying to prevent damage, it quickly becomes a money losing thing. Um, but, you know, if you stay in those really low rates, you, you, you can run the risk of not having an enough effect, but you won't run the risk of causing any damage. Uh, so there are some fancier oils that you can go crazy with and will never cause any damage. And now I think there are some new products that, that work in similar ways. I would thank you for that, Kevin. I also wanna add that if you go to this webinar, which I really think you should, I think it's valuable for you to look at. If there's anything that crosses your mind in regards to huh, I wonder if it would help here, or I wonder if doing this has any, reach out to us and we can set up research trials and see if we can get funding for it. So this is for you. We wanna do research that helps you out. So reach out with any of your suggestions and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, and the other thing I would add is if you are gonna play around with this stuff, if Jen uh, is gonna set up a research trial for you, or if uh, you wanna do it on your own, uh, when you start to play with oils, I almost nobody is in this region. I would if I had a frost pocket, um, if I could blend, because even if you cause a delay and you're worried about bricks, probably going to catch up, especially if things are early. Even if it didn't, there's something you can probably blend with. But what you want to do is pay attention to these charts that she's putting together, because that's how you select your timing. You want to know um, when you are in a stage where things are starting to deacclimate, and that's probably when you're going to time things. So if you want to be really aggressive, it was probably a week ago. Um, you wouldn't know that without this information. Uh, it would be better information if you did it yourself uh, to know what's going on in your farm, but you know you get a general idea of when things start to deacclimate with this information. So, and we can tell by looking online that they are starting to deacclimate now. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's all we have for this week. I certainly don't have any more questions for Jen, but if you guys do, uh, comment down below or contact us in your usual way. We are certainly available in here to answer those questions. And if not, we will see you next week for our next update. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone.